1947, Jackie Robinson played first base for the Brooklyn Dodgers, ending a six-decade ban on black players in Major League Baseball. After that, opportunities for athletes of color began to expand. A little more than a decade later, Daryl Hill became the first black athlete at his Washington, D.C. high school. Yeah, firsts were not uncommon in his family. His great-grandfather was the first African-American to serve on the D.C. Fire Department in the early 1900s, and both his father and his grandfather owned trucking companies, the largest black-owned companies in the region. Now, Daryl continued a lifetime of firsts, and as we found out during a visit to his home and trap, although it wasn't easy, he shows no signs of stopping. And I quit touchdown pass. Daryl Hill of Trap may have decades of life behind him, but he's still blazing yeah. a trail there you are. ahead of yeah. him. <laughs> I came from a family of sort of groundbreakers. Hill's pioneering period began at Gonzaga College High School in Washington, D.C. There, he was the first black player on the school's football team. After graduating at 16, Football scholarship sent him to Xavier University in Ohio. Then one day my mother called me and said, if I can get you an appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy, will you go? Well, this was like March. And I knew the appointments had closed. And I said, sure, Mom, I'll go. You know, I, about a month or so later, I get a letter that says, congratulations, you've been appointed a midshipman in the United States Naval Academy, uh, John F. Kennedy. There, he became the first African-American to play football at a military academy. But it made a big deal about it, which, which was fine. I, I didn't focus on it much. You know, I was more concerned about how many passes could I catch. <laughs> and he caught a lot of passes. Most were from another rising football star by the name of Roger Staubach. We became a pass-catch combination, you know. But Hill's time at the Naval Academy was short. He says, he didn't want to be a naval officer. It's a lot of rigmarole to go through if that's not your ultimate goal. That's when University of Maryland coach Lee Corso recruited him to be a Terrapin. And I said, well, coach, you, you forgot what conference you're playing in. You play in the Atlantic Coast Conference, segregated conference. So at the time, blacks, there were no blacks playing football below the Mason-Dixon line. But Hill says, he wasn't sure he wanted to play football. And I said, ah, come on, coach. I want to go to college and be a normal student. You know, I'm going to drink some beer and you know, have some fun, chase some girls. You know, I don't need to be under the spotlight, which I will be, you know, if I come here. So he looked at me and said, oh, I get it, I get it. You're scared, aren't you? Well, that was the right button to push. <laughs> I said, all right, <laughs> you got me. Of course, that was the best decision I could ever make. But it wasn't easy. At first, Clemson University and University of South Carolina both threatened to leave the Atlantic Coast Conference if Maryland played Hill. Wilson Elkins, president of Maryland at the time, said, you can do what you got to do, but he's coming. And he did, but it wasn't without threats and intimidation. Before the season opener at College Park, someone threatened to shoot Hill if he stepped foot on the football field. They said, we're going to be on top of the dormitories that overlooked the stadium. Those, there were some high rises there that overlooked the stadium. Opening kickoff comes, I fumbled it. <laughs> kickoff. Because <laughs> I was looking up at the, <laughs> I was looking at the high rise. <laughs> and I, I went, but fortunately, the ball hit me in the chest. Hits the ground, hits the nose, hits the point, and jumps right back in my hand. I ran at 50 yards <laughs> out. And so we played the game. So Maryland used to have a, a cannon that they shot off in the uh, stadium after touchdown. And in time Maryland scored a touchdown, they just cannon went bam, real loud, you know. It's still there, but they moved it away from the field. Mm -hmm. I scored a touchdown and shot the cannon off, and I fell all out. I thought I'd been shot. <laughs> Maryland continued to do what was necessary to protect their star player, especially when the team traveled to South Carolina to play. They had a team meeting without me, Maryland football team, and they said, all right, we're going to South Carolina. We usually stay at the Hilton in, in Columbia, South Carolina, but they don't let blacks stay there. And the team voted. He can't stay, we don't stay. So 
we wound up in a little motel, little strip motel, like a 45 minute drive out of town. The team even had to get creative to travel to the stadium. So we had to take uh, an army bus. So we rode, we rode to, the, to the stadium in a green, you know, army bus and then parked right at the door to the locker room. You know, so all we had to do is just come off the bus and run in, that, run in the locker room. And Hill had those who looked out for him on the field, like teammate Jerry Fishman. He said, they don't like me any better down south than they like you. Fishman was Jewish and had already been subjected to taunts from the stands. Fishman said, I'm going to look out for you, you know. <laughs> I said, okay. And he did in a sort of way because he put the rule down with the players on the team when I first got there, first day of practice. He said, you mess with him, you got to see me. <laughs> see? And Darrell adds not everyone was hostile toward him, most notably quarterback and future halfback for the Dallas Cowboys, Dan Reeves. I was one of the captains at the game. And I got to the middle of the flip of the coin, Three captains, both teams, we were out there. Two of them don't shake my hand. The other one was Dan Reeves. And uh, he shook my hand and then turned to his teammates like, what's wrong with you guys? You know? Uh, and I always remember that about Dan Reeves. Daryl would go on to find other notable allies, such as Wake Forest's Brian Piccolo. He actually stood up to Wake Forest fans. They booing me in the stands as they always did, you know. And then they had cheers, you know, get the end off the field and all that kind of stuff. And I was going on. Piccolo comes over and puts his arms around my shoulder. You could have heard a pin drop in that joint. So, uh, and he ran the risk of being in disfavor, tarnishing his popularity. He didn't care. In fact, he apologized to Daryl for how the fans were acting. Piccolo's actions worked. Daryl was left alone for the rest of the game. Daryl said that when the team played at Clemson, his mother was refused entry to the whites only stadium. But Clemson president Robert Edwards took Mrs. Hill to his private box. The game went on and Daryl Hill set the ACC record in that game for pass receptions in a game, a record that stood for many, many years. And uh, after that game, his, uh, I guess the president had all of the whites only signs taken down from the stadium. Hmm. So he made that? a difference there. Isn't Absolutely. that amazing? But Daryl's story doesn't end there. Up next on Del Marva Life, Daryl takes his football career to the next level. And what follows football? Globe trotting and more trailblazing. Daryl Hill of Trap grew up in a segregated society, but that didn't stop him from shining on the football field. He says for the most part, when he, what he experienced from the players on the other teams was more positive than what he experienced from fans he encountered in the South. Yeah, he says most of the tough treatment he received from other players wasn't because of his race. It was because he was a star player and a threat. But that didn't stop Daryl from continuing to be a star just in a different field. As a wide receiver for the University of Maryland, Daryl Hill was able to break down long-standing rigid walls of segregation in Southern College athletics. But it wasn't easy. From death threats... I had police escorts every game. ...to trainers refusing to treat him after a hard tackle. I got knocked unconscious. The uh, trainers at Wake Forest trainers who had the oxygen say, why are we putting that mask on that Negro's face? Even displays of hatred placed on the football field. They had a turp and a turtle hanging by a noose from the goalposts. They had painted the hands and feet of the turtle black and the face black. Despite the obstacles and hatred, Daryl managed to achieve outstanding performances both on the football field and in the classroom. He graduated from Maryland in 1965 with a Bachelor of Science degree in economics. Next stop, the New York Jets. You know, I was a, on a fringe player mm -hmm. in the NFL, it had, and I was a wide receiver, and the, both of the guys on the Jets, Don Maynard and Bake Turner, Maynard's in the Hall of Fame, and Bake was an all-star, and uh, Joe Namath was quarterback. So there wasn't much room for, you know, for me to play. Daryl was on what they called the Taxi Squad. Which this was a school, a 
players that they gave them taxi money to come to practice. Mm -hmm. And then if they played you in a game, then they paid you. Otherwise, they gave you taxi money. So I didn't think I was going to make the team, but I was a, also a kick returner. So I did make it. So Neymar said, well, what you going, where are you going to stay? I said, well, I didn't get an apartment in New York when we broke training camp because I didn't think I was going to make the team. And he said, oh, you can come stay with me. And that was an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> but Daryl was ready for a new adventure. He didn't make it to the first game with the Jets. Instead, he got his master's degree and began his journey as an entrepreneur and champion for other minority-owned businesses, first with the Greater Washington Business Center. And the Greater Washington Business Center was a small and minority business development center. You know, nonprofit, federally funded operation, and we help minority and small businesses get started and operate and acquire capital and so forth and the Anacostia Economic Development Corporation. And this was a local community development corporation. And Anacostia, it was, it was a depressed area, is a depressed area in Washington, D.C. Uh, and our mission was, you know, to try to stimulate the economy by starting small businesses, and we were pretty good at it. Daryl was also the owner of the first black-owned fine dining restaurant in the district called W.H. Bone & Company. He would go on to own and operate three major business ventures in Russia, as well as other ventures in areas around the world. But no matter where he goes, he remains a loyal Terrapin. Maryland ended okay, and uh, you know, I'm proud of the school, I'm proud of the state. Today, Daryl owns two cannabis dispensaries, one in California and one right here in Cambridge. Areas where he felt he could stimulate job opportunities for African Americans and boost the local economy. And his legacy lives on at the University of Maryland. The Jones Hill House is an indoor collegiate sports training complex. The facility is named in honor of Hill and Billy Jones. He was the first black man to play basketball at the University of Maryland. The journey from a kid who just liked to get out on the playground and play ball. Yeah, I thought about football like you think all kids, everybody wants to play. To a team breaking color barriers to level the playing field for future minority athletes. And an adult creating business opportunities. Daryl Hill remains a prolific pioneer for those who follow in his path. And Daryl says he loves his home in Dorchester County, away from the hustle and bustle of the city. And as you heard, he once ran a swanky restaurant in D.C. That wasn't the only one he ran. He opened a restaurant in Atlanta and then another one in Washington, D.C. But Daryl says the best restaurants he has ever eaten at are right here on <laughs> Del Mar. But this man has been all around the world. But he says the best restaurants are here. His favorite is Mama Maria's in Trap. How about that? Not far from where he lives. Mm. That is amazing. Love, Daryl.